the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Happy to see so many of you with us tonight in this uh, series of Judaism in the World Today. As you know, during the past few months, we've been carrying on a number of lectures, uh, beginning with Mr. Meyer Levin, who spoke on the aspects of Israel and the world today, with Dr. Mordecai Kaplan, who sp gave three lectures on the future of the American Jew. And tonight we have with us Dr. Maurice Samuel, who is going to introduce his first lecture in his series on masterworks of Jewish literature. And tonight, I believe his subject is to be the people of the book, the Am HaSefer. And the first of these lectures should, in a real sense, serve as the crown of our series, since in reality, everything that came before in our lecture series, both on Israel and the future of the American Jew, finds its bearings in the Bible. For without the rich foundation of the Bible, there would be little to recall or to talk about as distinctively Jewish. I bring out this thought, my dear friends, because it is one of the central themes in our guest lecture's latest creative writing, The Gentleman and the Jew. And I hope that Dr. Samuel will have an opportunity to talk about this thesis during his lecture series. For me, reading Dr. Samuel's interpretation of Judaism in The Gentleman and the Jew has been a real, rich, invigorating experience. His keen interpretation of the biblical and prophetic spirit with its non-combative, non-competitive view of life casts a strange and unknown spell over the reader in our war-torn world. These ideas can serve as a refreshing, cool oasis in a world overrun by the threats of war with its constant competitive wranglings, with its loud roars of combativeness. I know that Dr. Samuel has the ability to hold his listening audience spellbound and to weave for them a story which is both refreshing and instructive, even as he holds his reading audience. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Samuel to our series on Judaism in the world today and to present him to you tonight, Dr. Samuel. Rabbi Schnitzer, ladies and gentlemen, I think I ought to explain at the outset that uh, due to circumstances not under my control, I've been compelled to condense the four lecture series into three lectures, and that therefore there will be a distribution of the material which differs from the announcement which uh, Rabbi Schnitzer has just made. Originally, the thesis was presented to me under the overall title of Cultural and Literary Aspects of Jewish Life. And I picked out three, as it were, mountain peaks in Jewish cultural creativity. But as a consequence of this redistribution, I've got to change the material of each lecture while trying to conserve the general spirit of the series. And this evening I shall speak not only of the biblical foundations of Jewish uh, cultural creativity, I shall come into the modern world also uh, and give you a sort of preamble to the second lecture, which will take place on, what is it, February the 14th? 14th. February the 14th. 
Uh, it may sound a little bit academic to some of you, I'm sure it does to most modern Jews, to speak of the Bible as being a uh, living and continuous influence in Jewish life and Jewish thinking. Because as a matter of fact, uh, Jews are quite ignorant of the Bible on the whole. Uh, perhaps even more ignorant than pious Gentiles, pious Christians. Yet I shall show you, I think, that despite this alienation in recent times from the sources of Jewish consciousness and Jewish self-consciousness, there is this continuity of effect insofar as there is a Jewish literature at all. And there is a most astonishing consistency in the character of the cultural self-expression of the Jewish people. A consistency and a peculiarity which until very recent times set the Jews apart in a rather extraordinary and uh, difficult class of mental and uh, spiritual experience. I'm sure that those of you who have given the, least at uh, the slightest attention to the contrast between ancient Jewish literature and the literature of the classical world of Greece and Rome will have noticed what seems to be an amazing juxtaposition of a monolithic effect in Jewish literature and a pluralistic effect in the literature of Greece and Rome. In the literature of the ancient Gentile world, that world which the forefathers of the present Jewry, the contemporaneous Jews of that period, uh, considered uh, uh, ungodly and uh, idol-worshipping, in that literature there was an enormous variety which anticipates, as a matter of fact, almost every branch of literary creativity in the modern world. And not only that, the tone of the life of the modern world, both on the highest intellectual and artistic levels and on the popular levels also, was set in that period. There are, of course, in the modern world, variations and uh, inventions which would have been quite strange to the ancient world. Nevertheless, if you think of comedy, satire, tragedy, history, philosophy, plain narrative, fanciful stories, you'll find everything that there is in the modern world reproduced in the ancient world, or rather, it is a reproduction of that which was in the ancient world. You may even find a close parallelism between the essential ideas of the ancient Stoics and the modern mechanists, the ancient uh, Platonists and the modern vitalists and mystics. There is hardly a branch of modern philosophy, hardly an essential intellectual experience of the modern world, which wasn't already foreshadowed, and set down in the ancient world. Whether you think of the uh, political and uh, spiritual philosophy of Plato, or of the satire and comedy of Aristophanes, or of the tragedy of Aeschylus and Euripides, or of the fanciful stories of an Apuleius, whom uh, many of you must know because he wrote that uh, charming and uh, provocative story of the golden ass or the metamorphoses, or the history of uh, uh, Livy, or before him of Herodotus, or the spiritual strivings of the Neoplatonists. If you go through those, you will discover the origins and the parallels to practically every modern major intellectual experience. But if you go to Jewish literature from ancient times with the Bible as the center, 
but with a very large periphery extending to uh, an enormous distance, you will discover there is a curious monochrome, or an apparent monochrome of experience and of uh, expression. It's true that in the Bible, in the Tanakh, that is, I'm excluding the New Testament for uh, the reason that it needs a particular and extensive attention in other directions. If you take the Tanakh, the apocryphal writings, which were excluded from the canon, uh, like the book of Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, the book of Enoch, the book of the Jubilees, and a host of others. If you take the Mishnah, uh, which is available in English, and uh, I recommend to your attention in the translation of Canon Danby. If you take the Boraitas, the material which was parallel with the Mishnaic literature, but was excluded from the secondary canon of the Mishnah, if you take the later productions of the scholars who gave that enormous interpretation of the Mishnah, which is contained in the Talmud, you will discover that there seems to be a uniformity of outlook and a monotony of productivity. If you look a bit closer, you discover the traces of a great variety, but only the traces. The material has been essentially subdued to the purpose and the outlook of the Jewish cultural, uh, Jewish cultural interpretation of life. For instance, you will find in the Bible a purely philosophical, partly cynical work called Ecclesiastes. You remember that it's not particularly Jewish in its outlook. It seems to have overtones of the Greek cynics, of the Greek sophists. And yet, after a long struggle, it was included in the canon. Or you take a very extraordinary book like the book of Esther, which is a kind of a Guy de Maupassant story, a story of Parisian intrigue, which appears suddenly in the midst of the Bible, and in the whole course of which, interestingly, in, interestingly enough, God isn't mentioned. A book in the Bible, the book of Esther, in which the name of God and in which the guiding uh, power of God doesn't appear even in the slightest allusion. Or you take embedded in the general uh, record of the, uh, uh, of the early, or at least of the purportedly early experiences of the Jews, the story of Joseph. It's really a mixture of the Arabian Nights and of a Horatio Alger success story. The little Jew boy who went down into Egypt, the little immigrant who went into an alien country, worked his way up to the top, became practically the president of the country, or the grand vizier, the Sheni Lemelech, and how his brothers who had despised him uh, came to him for help, and after teasing him a little bit, he, uh, he, he did help them. A most incongruous story, if you take it from the point of view of its objective material, worked, however, into the strain of Jewish history and given a coloration which somehow places it squarely in the middle of the Bible, which is evidence that the Jews did receive material from the outside. I shall revert to this subject of Jewish absorption of external material when I come to talk of the modern world, Jews did take material from the outside and to a very large extent, not always with complete success, but to a very large extent, they assimilated it into the spirit of this book. Uh, the Jewish historian Simon Dubnow points out, for example, that the early stories of the reign of King David, with that long list of the giborim, of the heroes who formed his corps d'élite, the whole of that period is contemporaneous practically with the Iliad and the Odyssey, and that there is an epic, epical quality, at least of the raw material 
of that which went into the story of David's conquest of uh, Palestine or of the remainder of Palestine and its assimilation into the Jewish kingdom. That too has been altered, colored, and fitted into the general purposive attitude of the Hebraic writing. Now what is that general purposive attitude? And what is it that throws this uniformity of spirit upon material that originally may have been extremely varied in the raw form? It is, uh, if one is to put it uh, succinctly, the irradiation of every type of experience with a religious and spiritual purpose. The distinction between the historical outlook of the ancient Hebrews and the historical outlook, let us say, of a Thucydides or of a Livy is this, that a Thucydides or a Livy did not see history as the continuous expression of the will of God to integrate itself with uh, a human existence. Livy, to some extent, was already influenced by the desire to make Roman history a propaganda for the Roman spirit. There are faint touches of this kind of uh, special pleading. But on the whole, it is merely the story of what happened or of what was supposed to happen. It is presumably an objective record by a man who went to ancient sources, found out what had taken place since the days of Romulus and of Remus, until the days when uh, Livy was writing about the time of uh, Augustus, the first of the emperors. And there you have it. It is supposed to be a record accessible to the intelligence of all the world. In Thucydides and in Herodotus, whatever may be the inaccuracies, the factual inaccuracies to which they were subject, nevertheless the story purports to be something that took place and something which you may read as a Greek or as a barbarian without being obligated to fuse yourself with the material. This wasn't the case with the historic outlook of the Jews. When the Jews wrote history, they were concerned not merely with the uh, objective, so to speak, statistical events. They were concerned with the history of an idea, and that idea was the Jewish idea. They were concerned with the vicissitudes among the Jewish people of the original inspiration of the Jewish people. And this I have to explain in order that you may see what an enormous and sometimes oppressive consistency was thrown over the whole of Jewish cultural material, turning it from what we generally consider the raw cultural into the purposive cultural. There is an astonishing repetitiveness in Jewish history. And whenever one comes into Jewish history, it's like coming into a movie that you've seen a number of times, and you're inclined to say, this is where I came in. It's difficult to consider even the contemporaneous problems of the Jewish people, or perhaps even less the contemporaneous problems of the Jewish people, without becoming aware of the fact that this has been recorded before, and that there is a repetition of what has taken a repetition with variations of what has taken place, but a repetition nevertheless. By the way, you will find this point of view expressed with great artistic cogency and appeal in Thomas Mann's uh, Joseph cycle. That uh, extraordinary midash produced by a Goy and a war Goyim by a German, constituting, in my opinion, the most brilliant interpretation of Jewish life that has appeared in the 20th century. This thesis of the eternal repetition of the original purpose with an instructive variation and therefore some degree of progress on each level of ascension. Consider, for instance, the position today, the building of the State of Israel. There is a fascinating problem which confronts us in connection with that the problem of the admission of the refugees. And you know there's a good deal of heart-burning and of heart-searching among Jews interested in the building of the Jewish state as to whether it was wise, perhaps it was inevitable, 
but whether it was wise to have yielded so easily and so invitingly to the influx, to the enormous influx of refugees into Israel, or whether there should have been some attempt, overt or covert, at selectivity. And we find ourselves now the heirs to a difficult, difficult problem. A few years ago, and a panic of compassion swept over the Jewish people in connection with those who had survived the Hitler Holocaust. And there was a universal cry, take all those Jews for heaven's sake, bring them into Israel, whatever the consequences are. We can't stop now to consider whether Israel will be flooded and whether the original purposes of the founders of the Zionist movement, whether the original purpose of the subconscious Zionist movement will be served by the admission of this enormous inchoate and uh, unindoctrinated material, let them in. And compassion triumphed over policy. And yet, astoundingly enough, there was an episode in Jewish life when Moses led a refugee people out of Egypt. And you remember from the accounts that the Jews had been in Egypt for many generations, 400 years, the Bible says. The Midrash explains that it wasn't 400 years, it was only 210 years, but the 400 years was counted from the time when uh, Abraham visited the first Pharaoh. At any rate, 210 years. And of these 210 years, the majority had been years of slavery, oppression, and of uh, massacre. They didn't have the uh, gas chambers or the ovens, but they had the practice of throwing the youngsters, the boys, into the Nile and the Jews were segregated in labor camps, and uh, they built the treasure houses, the treasure cities of the pharaohs, Pithom and Ramesses. And the usual consequences of long subjection to, to uh, oppression and to labor were visible in those refugees whom Moses finally led out of Egypt. And you would have said, as a contemporaneous Jew of ours would say, for God's sake, take those Jews out of Egypt and lead them into Palestine. The poor wretches deserve uh, some kind of nachas, finally, in their lives. They are entitled to some sort of rest. But the extraordinary thing that Moses did, entirely repugnant to our modern feelings with regard to refugees, the thing that Moses did was this. He took them out of Egypt, and instead of leading them by the shortcut across the desert, in the course of three or four weeks by the plain of Pelusium into Palestine, to the land which had been promised them and promised their forefathers, he led them first of all down south into the peninsula to Sinai. And at Mount Sinai they were suddenly confronted with an alternative. Either they accept the Torah or God would, according to the legend, lift up the mountain and crush them underneath it. And the Jews who were very quick at making a bargain even in those days said, Nase we hear we, we will obey and we will do and we will obey. And after they had signed the contract, as it were, by which they pledged themselves to be obedient to the Torah, by which they pledged themselves to bid a, bid, build a particular kind of life in Palestine, not entering it as of right because they were refugees, but because they were entrusted with a special mission to set a special example to the world, when they had accepted that, they were permitted to resume the journey. And very shortly afterwards, they forfeited whatever right they had originally had by their rebellions against Moses and against the Torah. And these miserable refugees never got to Palestine. Their bones whitened the desert sands. For 40 years, the last survivors wandered about in the desert, and it was only their children who were admitted into Palestine. Now just imagine if a modern Jew were to propose to the refugees in Yemen, or the remainders in uh, Romania and in Poland, you can't come into Palestine, into Israel. You're not fit for it. You die where you are. We'll take the children. What a howl of rage would go up from the Jewish people. And uh, what a swift end there would be to any kind of Zionist administration which made this proposal. So much so that one is uh, faced with a suspicion one is moved to the suspicion that probably the account in the Bible, in the book of uh, Exodus and in the book of Numbers, is a slightly colored one. Moses probably wasn't such a gazlan as he is there represented to be. He wasn't such an achzer. And what actually took place was, well, we don't know. But if that is the case, 
if that story was written later by the Jewish people, it is an even more extraordinary circumstance. Because then it means that the Jewish people, being in Palestine, in possession of the land, actually challenged their own title to it. And unnecessarily threw a doubt upon their possession of it, saying, we were admitted to this country only for the purpose of leading a special kind of life. And if we fail to lead this kind of life under certain example, we're going to be thrown out. And when they were thrown out, they said, it serves us right. Mind on a little of the, of, the, of the criminal who was about to be hung, and at the last moment before they sprang the trap, he said meditatively, this will teach me a lesson. <laughs> now, this amazing uniformity of outlook as to the relationship between the Jews and the country in which they lived is the key to the attitude which dictated the tonality of all the historic records and of all the cultural material. The Jews saw history not as something which is detached from revelation. They didn't consider that, well, here is what we are supposed to do, and here is what we actually do being faced with the necessities and the compulsions of life, and between the two there is a very tenuous kind of relationship. You may make a lecture occasionally, and you may hold a sermon, and somebody may come and tell you this is how you ought to be, but nobody pays any particular attention to it. The Jews didn't take that attitude at all. They said that which we do, and that which is preached to us, fuses, these two fuse into a single historic reality. And history is explicable only on the basis of the original contract with the divine purpose. That is why history was subdued or, uh, or sub immersed in the um, religious and theological outlook. It was impossible for them to conceive any branch of human activity which was abstracted from the prophetic or the religious outlook. And that is the uniformity which is cast like a kind of spell on all the historical material. Now, you will find among the records and uh, legends and epics of the non-Jewish world surrounding the Jewish people, material which is obviously free, not merely the historical, but uh, legends and uh, anecdotes and uh, ancient fables which seem to belong somewhere else. There is the theogony of that people, the story of the birth of the gods. There is the story of the relationship of man to the gods. And quite apart from that, a vast quantity of material, quite like in the modern world, which has no relationship to it, which is free thought. There was no such free thought among the Jews. If it was a love song, like the Song of Songs, it was made to uh, subserve a religious purpose and was given a religious interpretation. If it was the original legends of how the patriarchs arose, well, the very first of the patriarchs was made to assume his identity only by virtue of the fact that he had been the first one to recognize God. Or as Thomas Mann puts it, God saw this little man here on the earth, striving after him, and was so delighted with him that he kissed his fingertips to him and said, that man's going to be my friend. The founder of the people was the founder of the religion. And there again you have this divergence between the outlook of the free peoples who disassociate the God idea from all other activities and the people which is completely locked in the God idea. Among the free peoples... There is no necessary connection between the rise of the people and the religion to which it is attached, or which is attached to it. And it's so in the modern world. One is an Englishman, a Frenchman, an American, an Italian, or whatever it is, and independently of that, one may be a Catholic, or a Protestant, or a variety of one of these churches, or one may be a Buddhist, or whatever it is, it does not, as it were, impugn one's Englishness, or, or Americanism, or, or Gallicism, or whatever it might be. The reason being that first the people was formed. Afterwards, the religion was attached to it, coming from the outside. 
This wasn't the case with the Jewish record or with the Jewish consciousness. In the case of the Jews, the birth of the people and of the religion were coterminous. A man arose to found the people in order to spread a religion. And again, it doesn't matter whether you take the record of Abraham as being a literal event in history. It is the interpretation which is thrown back upon the original story and which takes that story and works it into the texture of the Jewish consciousness. Now, at what period the Jews evolved this consciousness, I don't know, and far more competent scholars than I don't know. But it appears as early as there is Jewish self-expression. And it is this uniformity, it is to uh, this consistency of interfusion and to give it universally the Jewish coloration. This is something that you do not find elsewhere, at least in anything like the same degree. The difference of degree here becomes a difference of quality. Quantity is, uh, by a revolutionary uh, process, uh, transposed into quality. Take the modern Jewish life. By modern, I mean that in the last 100 or 150 years. There has been the change which gives us the key to what was the original process. Jewish life of 100 or 150 years ago was very different from Jewish life of today. And when I speak of our fathers, our grandfathers and great-grandfathers, and of the difference between their outlook on life and ours, you will catch a glimpse of what was the basic purpose of that Jewish consciousness which I have uh, briefly described. A hundred years ago, or a hundred and fifty years ago, the Jewish groups in the world lived in isolated but in not insulated communities. Up till a hundred and a hundred, a hundred and fifty years ago, and continuously, though in diminishing degree, until fifty years ago, you would have Jewish communities, large and small, sometimes very small, in the villages in Russia. Jewish communities which were capable and had been capable for centuries of absorbing the raw material of the outside world and turning it into Jewish instruments of expression. One of the difficulties that I have universally with my lecture audiences is the fixation the Jews have on the subject of the old ghetto life of the Jews. The impression that that life was segregated from all influences from the surrounding world was a kind of paralysis, or at any rate, was a kind of monomania to which no ideas from the outside world could penetrate. The impression that Jewish life was suspended and that history marched by the Jewish people until the walls of the ghetto were broken down and the floods carried away the hard core, the hard internal core, and scattered it among the nations. It's a completely false outlook. If you examine what Jewish life was like until very recently, if you take the material of Jewish self-expression, you discover an amazing residue of external influences within the Jewish people converted into purely Jewish modes of expression. Take the language of the Jewish people, or the mass of the Jewish people, in the last uh, uh, 100, 150, 200, 300 years. Yiddish. Yiddish, as most of you know, is, as far as its raw material is concerned, uh, the actual substance of the language, is 90, 85 to 90 percent Germanic. It was taken from Middle High German in the 12th and 13th centuries and adapted by the Jews. But after having been taken by the Jews, it was modeled and molded and polished and reshaped, Magyargevain, circumcised. All sorts of things were done to it until in the end it was specifically and irretrievably Jewish. And if you want a single sentence which illustrates the gap dividing Yiddish from German, 
And how the German doesn't understand Yiddish, in spite of the uh, presumable similarity of the two languages, all you can say is, I crank up the Deutsch state. <laughs> in which you have all the words which are originally in German, and the spirit of the sentence is entirely alien to the German language. This, of course, apart from the uh, Hebraic words, the Hebraic expressions, and the Slavic words, and other words, which were introduced. What is of importance here is that the Jews took this material from the outside world, a material which elsewhere was developed into German. And you know what the German language is. Remember perhaps the Jew who once said, long ago, he said, the Deutschens are a fine folk, not the Sloshen hargetzer <laughs> weg. The Germans, the Germans are a very fine people, but that language of theirs is just too awful for words. This Germanic material, this predominantly Germanic material, was taken into the Yiddish fold. And it was so irradiated with the specifically Jewish outlook that you have an amazing spiritual congruity between the religious uh, adaptability of Yiddish and the religious creativity in Hebrew. There are men, among them Professor Heschel in his recent book, The Earth is the Lord's, who say that the spiritual crea creation of the Hasidim is not inferior to the spiritual creation of the Hebrew prophets. Now, that is a very daring statement. I would not be prepared either to endorse or to challenge it, but it's quite certain that there is an enormous similarity between the Jewish outlook of the Hasidim and the prophetic morality, and that the Hasidic movement was one of the most fascinating and one of the profoundest religious experiences in human history. Yet the Hasidic experience was, at least in its inception, and to a large extent during its early development, almost exclusively Yiddish. The Baal Shem Tov who in the early 18th century, say 1730, 1740, began his mission among the Jews, the Baal Shem Tov was not a scholar. He didn't speak to scholars. He went among the ordinary poor people, among the laborers, and among them he found the inspiration, among them he found the audience for this extraordinarily beautiful, profound, and very subtle interpretation of the relationship between man and God. It was a Yiddish creation, not a Hebrew creation. Yet it is deeply in the spirit and in the continuity of the Hebrew tradition. Now I say this in order to point out how the language as raw material was taken from the outside world, put into Jewish life, and made the unmittelbar, the immediate, immediate expression of all that was specifically and typically Jewish for the last 2,500 years. An instance which repeats what the Jews did of old, taking the modes of expression of the outside world, the pastoral as in uh, Ruth, and the, the uh, philosophical as in Ecclesiastes, and the epical as in the uh, story of the fighters of King David, and the purely fantasist as in the story of, uh, of Joseph, to whatever extent this material was taken from the outside, and absorbing it, giving it the coloration and the texture and the purpose of the Jewish will. But that isn't all in Jewish life. It isn't merely the literary side, because if one speaks of the cultural aspects of a people, one must go to every variety of self-expression. To music, for instance. We don't know anything about ancient Jewish music. We can only surmise and that in uh, very uh, uncertain forms. But if you take modern Jewish music, if you take the music of the, of the Hasidim, if you take the Hasidic nigndl, as it's called, which uh, to many of us uh, has always been so peculiarly and intimately and nostalgically, nostalgically Jewish, what can you do with a Hasidic nigndl except feel that it's ours and has been forever? As a matter of fact, our Hasidic nigunim are taken from surrounding peoples. They are taken from the white Russians, from the uh, Wallachians. Some of you may have heard the expression avolocho, a piece of music in Yiddish, which we consider our own, or taken from the Poles, 
Of course, we took that and we gave it a, uh, a grace note here and a poggiatura there and a kretz and a kretz, and we made it ours. Nevertheless, the raw material was taken from the surrounding world and absorbed into the Jewish field. Take, for instance, the clothes of the East European Jews, particularly the clothes of the Hasidim, you know, the long, the uh, kapot and the streimel, the first streimel and the white stockings. Jews are under the impression that this was eternally Jewish. And the old Orthodox Jew of 50, 60 years ago could have sworn that Moses wore just that kind of costume when he ascended Mount Sinai for the purpose of, re of receiving the Shnei Luchot Abrit. But of course, many of us know that those clothes were not ancient Hebrew. They were the clothes of the Polish Shlachta, the Polish nobility, worn by the upper Polish classes uh, five, six, uh, four hundred years ago, and still reproduced in paintings and in old prints. You come across old prints in which uh, you see the Polish Jews, uh, Polish figures, uh, men with uh, the chalat and with the streimel and with the uh, white stockings, but they uh, and and the beards, but they have pointed noses and the slanted eyes and high cheekbones. They have uh, uh, the faces of uh, Tartars are of the Easterners, and they're not Jews at all, they're Poles. That was the dress, of, the dress of the Poles. What happened was that when the Poles discarded these clothes, the Jews who were apparently already in the second-hand clothing business picked them up <laughs> and made it, the Jewish, made it the Jewish national dress. So much so that if recently a young Jew in Europe, say 40 or 50 years ago, he made his coat short, and put on a bowler hat and black stockings, the family sat shiver for him. And I'm not saying that uh, facetiously or by way of exaggeration. It was actually so. They sat shiver for him, and with some justification, because in a large number of cases, it was actually a symbolic and substantive repudiation of Jewish association. If you take the matter of food, what we call Jewish food, and that's also an expression of the culture of the people, it's not Jewish at all, at least in its origins. Gefilte fish was not invented by the Jews. It may have been perfected by them. <laughs> it wasn't invented by them. Fish on Friday is not a Jewish custom in origin. It's not even Christian in origin. It is pre-Christian and probably has to do with a god like Dagon, the fish god, and some kind of taboo uh, 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 which was attached periodically once every seven or fourteen days to the eating of the flesh of that God. We don't know. But all this I tell you in order to indicate to what an enormous extent, utterly unrealized, the Jews, while they were in a healthy condition, absorbed from the surrounding world and made it the material of their own self-expression, absorbed it and always made it subserve their one particular outlook, their one particular purpose, which was the expression of all life under the religious aspect. Now, this has been going on for 2,500, 3,000, 3,500 years. The origin of it is lost in antiquity. We couldn't fix the period. But as long as Jewish life was healthy, this uniformity prevailed in all the cultural and literary creativity of the Jews. You will not find anywhere in the literature of the Jews, whether among those branches of it which I first described, uh, going all the way from the uh, core or kernel of Jewish self-expression, the Tanakh, and reaching into the apocryphal and the exegetical literature, the Midrash and the Talmud, you will not find anywhere either the variety which dominates the ancient classical world, nor the particular spirit of playfulness, gamesomeness, and combativeness which gave to most of their literature, or at any rate to a very large proportion of it, the aspect of an eternal contest. You can't read uh, Plato or Herodotus or any of the ancients with the exclusion perhaps of the extreme Stoic teachers that are say like uh, Epictetus or uh, Marcus Aurelius 
And I can't even include Seneca now as I come to think of it. You can't read the ancient literature of the Greeks and the Romans without being aware of the fact that throughout all the philosophic attitude to life, there ran an interpretation which might be called the sportive. And in fact, in the ancient world, the sportive ranked with the philosophical as, in their opinion, the obverse of the reverse in the same medal of life. A, uh, an Aeschylus, a Plato, a Socrates even, a much more serious man than Plato, considered the palestrum, uh, considered the, the, uh, the arena, they considered the gymnasium of equal importance with the symposium or with the classroom, with the uh, grove of academe. There was in their philosophical disposition and activity a touch of the physical competitive and in the physical competitive an implication of the mental struggles of the philosophers. And to them the uh, beauty of the body, the grace of the body, the ability to fight, the ability to endure, the ability to put forth the maximum agony in physical contest was one side of the ability to be able to think something through. It never appeared in Jewish life. Nor did there appear in Jewish life, either from the ancient world or from the modern world in its expressions, there didn't appear in Jewish life the division of nations, peoples, groups, cities, counties, governments, into, con into a contemporaneous contestants via the arena. The enormous spectacles where you might have, say, 70, 80,000 gathered in the Colosseum, or 200,000, 300,000, and there was room for them, gathered around the Circus Maximus in Rome, or in the Circus Maximum, Maximus of the new Rome on the Bosphorus, when that was founded by, by um, Constantine. A passionate addiction to sports, not simply as sports, but interpreted as the a playful, ritualistic representation of life's profoundest purpose. It comes down to modern times. In modern times, because we have precipitated out, at least verbally or formally, the religious from the non-religious, we disguise or we evade the connection. But nowadays you will find the same convulsive or cataleptic interest in sporting events as you found in the ancient world. You only have to witness here in the modern world, if you're in America, a, uh, a World Series, or if you happen to be in England, a test match, and you find the whole of the nation walking around with glazed eyes in a sort of, uh, of trance, and everyone's remark to everyone, uh, everyone else is, what's the score? <laughs> or it might be in French, or it might be in German, and we're inclined to regard this somewhat facetiously. And they think, oh, well, it's just a game. But it isn't. Because the sporting attitude and the, uh, the interpretation of life as contest and competition finds itself served and enhanced and quickened and pointed by this universal passion for sport. You can't publish a newspaper. You can't found a university. You can't conduct a university. Even our Jewish university up there, uh, Brandeis, has got its football team all of a sudden. I must say between you and me, I hope it gets licked on every occasion when it goes, when it goes into a contest. But it's got its football field. I don't know how Yeshiva College is doing. Does anybody here know whether Yeshiva College has a uh, football team yet or a bas basketball? Well, they have a basketball team. No, they're a glitter. So they have a basketball team. But in the ancient world, it was unknown. And certainly in the Yeshiva, in the genuine Yeshiva, it was also unknown. And that has persisted from the ancient into the modern world as far as the Jews are concerned. I used to be under the impression when I was uh, a youngster, and uh, I knew even less than I do now about history, that one could explain this absence of the sportive, the combative, the, the competitive, the, the, uh, the spectacular, the emotional involvement of masses among the Jews in this sort of thing, uh, for a variety of reasons connected with the obvious uh, physical and political condition of the Jews. The Jews uh, lived a segregated and isolated life. There was no spaciousness in their existence, either in the literal or in the figurative sense of the word. 
they didn't have the area in which to sport themselves. They couldn't go horseback riding. They hadn't the village green on which to dance or on which to uh, uh, do their wrestling and their quarterstaff fighting. Uh, they didn't have their Ashby de la Zouches at which, at which they could hold their, their, uh, their tournaments. And apart from that, they were pitted against the world in a type of contest in which the physical wouldn't have helped them, would in fact have betrayed them. They lived by their wits. Not in the uh, objurgatory sense of that phrase, but in the very literal sense. They lived by their wits. They could only survive if, by their brains, they managed to evade the physical challenge of the surrounding world. Imagine what would have happened to the Jews, that uh, helpless minority, if they had tried to, meet, tried to meet the world on the grounds, on the challenging grounds which the world had chosen. But it disappeared long ago. So I said, it's quite obvious if the Jews don't go in for sports, it's because it would have been fatal to them. Because they could never have uh, coped with the physical, over, overwhelming physical forces which surrounded them and threatened to overthrow them, so they resorted to the intellectual. Hence the contempt which they always displayed for the Yedei Esav, for the hands of Esau, and the affection which they displayed to the Kol Yankov, to the voice of Jacob. And it looked uh, very plausible as an explanation. Except that when I got to know Jewish history a little more intimately, I discovered that when the Jews were in their own country, they had this same addiction and this same exclusivity of concentration on the intellectual and on the God-given. So that apparently, if it was a fixation and nothing more, it wasn't to be explained by the curious, the peculiar circumstances which attended Jewish life during the diaspora. It went much further back and had to do with something, something which I can't explain, in the original direction given to the consciousness of this people. Now what is happening today is very difficult to analyze because we haven't got a large enough trajectory. We can't plot the further extension of this graph because there isn't sufficient material. In the last hundred years what happened was that the Jewish technique for the absorption of foreign material and its conversion to Jewish material, its coloration, its uh, conversion into Jewish material which could digest again further on non-Jewish material, this capacity disappeared. Not disappeared, became extremely weakened, successively weakened. The consequence is the Jews have lost that feeling of security which they had until about 100 or 150 years ago. Now, by security, I don't mean external security because you would be quite right in challenging me and saying they hadn't any. But there are two kinds of security, as you all know. Uh, every amateur psychoanalyst, which no doubt includes practically all the audience, knows that there are two kinds of security. There is the security which is a purely physical and, uh, so to speak, uh, a statistical security vis-à-vis -vis the surrounding world, and security with regard to your own personality. Security in the sense of the external world, the Jews certainly didn't have 150 years ago or 200 years ago or 1,500 years ago. But security in their personality, they certainly did have. They had it precisely because they had the capacity to absorb from their surrounding world so that the word assimilation, which is so sinister in Jewish life today, a hundred years ago, if it had been used at all, would have been used in a quite healthy sense of the twofold process of assimilation. One assimilates outward, one loses material, one assimilates inward, one absorbs material. This is the metabolism of an organism. It is true of the individual who discards material and absorbs it when the individual is healthy. It is true of the social organism, of a people, a tribe, a culture, a civilization, that it loses either persons or material and it absorbs. And as long as it has this capacity for the metabolism, it is really healthy in spite of all purely physical threats. 
So the Jew felt healthy. The Jew didn't feel abnormal. Now, the modern Jew does feel abnormal. He feels abnormal because this cultural and literary uniformity, this cultural and literary characteristic has disappeared, perhaps temporarily, and nothing has replaced it. What you have today is largely a people which is disoriented because it cannot absorb the material which comes in because it comes in at too rapid a rate. A hundred, a hundred and fifty years ago, the Jew did not feel that he was abnormal. If anybody needed adjusting, it was the Goy, not the Jew. It was the Goy who was abnormal. Because quite plainly, how can a human being be normal who doesn't eat matzahs on Pesach, doesn't fast on Yom Kippur, hasn't got a mezuzah on the door, doesn't know what a talus is, and doesn't go to kill on Shabbos? How can such a human being be normal? There's something wrong with the unfortunate Goy. True. Apparently he's able, he controls the world, he controls the destiny of the Jews, and uh, the Jewish uh, um, uh, security, whatever it is, uh, is in his hands, constantly precarious, because if the mood takes the guy, he can just make the Jew move on. Nevertheless, it is the guy who is abnormal and not the Jew. They tell a story of a Jewish father who about a hundred years ago was prevailed on, cajoled, bullied, or nagged into permitting his son to go and uh, study medicine in Berlin. And at the end of the first year, when the boy came back, the father asked him, uh, So the boy said, So the father said, So the boy said, So the father said in astonishment, <laughs> <laughs> It didn't occur to him that Jewish life was an appendage on the outside world. Now, it may be parochial, uh, the provincial, clean shtetlik. Nevertheless, it indicates a certain primitive healthiness of outlook. One which you will not find in the modern Jew whose cultural and literary relationship to his people has lost this implicitness of purpose, which was so continuous. And in uh, my interpretation of the Zionist movement, in my theory of why the Jewish homeland came into existence, it is this consideration which plays the dominant role. When the Zionist movement began a hundred years ago, and it did begin a hundred years ago, it was for the purpose of creating a new instrument or a new old instrument which should enable the Jew once more, living as he did largely scattered throughout the world, enable the Jew once more to absorb external material by holding before his eyes the spectacle of a specifically Jewish life. It was not a refugee movement in its inception. I say a hundred years ago, because actually the Zionist movement in its modern form is at least a hundred years old. The first Zionist classic, Roman Jerusalem, by Moses Hess, appeared, I think, in 1862. That's 88 years ago. And an idea which is already crystallized in the book must have been wandering about in inchoate and inarticulate form in the minds of a people for decades. And, in fact, we find in the early writings of uh, Mendele Mochas Forum already the indications of that terror of the new modern world which was moving the Jew to find the antidote in the recreation of the center of Jewish civilization. If it were true that Zionism came into existence because it was seeking an outlet for Jewish refugees, it would have come into existence long ago in the time of the Crusades, when there was a bitter need, in the time of Chmelnitsky, when there was a bitter need, that's in the 1600s. It didn't come into existence then. All that you had in the Middle Ages and all that you had in the time of Chmelnitsky was a messianic movement. A messianic movement is the very opposite of a political movement. A messianic movement is a furious, emotional, mystical, wishful thinking reaction to a situation which can be surmounted, if at all, only by practical steps. It's characteristic of a messianic movement that it flares up and dies down within 10, 15 years. Characteristic of a genuine and organic political movement that it develops slowly and becomes a sort of tidal effect as the circumstances which first gave it birth become deeper and more potent. Now, the Zionist movement did not begin in a flare-up of mysticism. 
It began vaguely, obscurely, and inarticulately among the masses of Eastern Europe in the 1840s. In the 1860s, Moses Hess was writing. In the 1870s, Mohelever and uh, others were writing. In 1890s, Herzl appeared. But by his time, the Zionist movement was already classical. There had been the Katowice Conference of 1882. Now, this slow, organic, massive growth characterizes the Zionist movement and sets it apart from the Messianic movements and proves that it was not a refugee movement. Because, as it happens, the time during which the Zionist movement came to itself was a time when the Jewish people was under the delusion that actual political persecution was on the permanent decline. You must remember that the Jews of Russia in the time of uh, uh, Alexander II were in a comparatively fortunate situation. The early 19th century, 1820, the time of... Uh, of uh, uh, Tsar Nicholas I was a time of persecution. The, so that if the Zionist movement had been a response to a refugee need, it certainly wouldn't have arisen during that period. It explains the change which has come over the Zionist movement in the last uh, 10, 15 years, which has turned the Zionist movement into a refugee concept. It doesn't explain the birth of the Zionist movement. What happened then was the awareness of the Jews Obscurely, it was never put into that form until the time of Ahad Ha'am, 40, 50 years later, the awareness of the Jews that the cultural and literary machinery of self-subsistence and self-perpetuation had broken down. That our capacity to absorb and assimilate and transpose had disappeared that the modern schools, compulsory education, popular education, popular lectures, cheap books, cheap magazines, evening classes, now the radio and TV, that all these things, and the latest were adumbrated in the first, that all these things were breaking into Jewish life with a rapidity at a tempo which made impossible their absorption. The Jewish people was in danger of losing its cultural and literary machinery, therefore its identity and its identity was a moralistic, theistic one. It wasn't an identity which partook of the uh, varieties of character that we found among the other peoples. It was one which set it apart from all the other peoples in a strange and almost inaccessible character of its own. Now, it is my contention that the purpose of the Zionist movement was to restore a machinery of Jewish creativity which means not only internal creation, but absorption from the outside world. In the next lecture, on February the 14th, I'm going to talk to you of Sholem Aleichem, Peretz, and Mendele. Or rather, I ought to put them in another order. Mendele, the grandfather of Yiddish literature, uh, Sholem Aleichem, and Peretz, his pupils and followers, and try to show you how in their literature and in their outlook, in spite of their conscious rejection of the Zionist ideal, in spite of their, in one case, anti-Zionism, in the other cases, non-Zionism, they, had they foreseen the trend of events and had they interpreted politically what they were, should have been Zionists. And it is fantastic to observe how at an interval of 2,000 years in this Yiddish language and in its uh, a classical expression, the three great masters of Yiddish literature, you discover the old theme emerging once more. The question remains whether in the final count, with the building of the State of Israel and with its as not yet achieved integration with the Jews of the diaspora, that problem of the restoration of the absorptive capacity of the Jewish people has been solved. And that we shall consider at the end of the second lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Samuels. I'm sure that uh, you have fulfilled every 
expectation of the audience and holding them spellbound with your uh, talk this evening. I'm wondering, are you planning to have a question and answer period for, few mo for say, for 15 to 20 minutes? Uh, if there are any questions uh, which the audience would like to place for Dr. Samuels, we're having the ushers bring to you some cards and some pencils. Perhaps that would be the easiest way. Would you uh, please write out your questions, hand them to the ushers, and we'll give them to Dr. Samuel, and he'll uh, try to answer them uh, in the order that he thinks appropriate. While we're waiting, I'd like to bring to your attention, again, the fact uh, which uh, Dr. Samuel has told you, namely that uh, due to certain circumstances, uh, Dr. Samuels will not be able to be with us on the 31st of January, which is his uh, second lecture. And he will try to combine uh, his second and third lecture on February 14th, which actually is four weeks from tonight. Uh, I'm calling this to your attention. You shall have uh, a notice in the mail a few days before it. I also like to call to your attention the fact that uh, Dr. Samuels and uh, Dr. Mordecai Kaplan will both appear in a final symposium to evaluate uh, their lecture series on Judaism in the world today. And I think it's going to prove to be an outstanding uh, symposium. And that's going to be held last week, last Wednesday in February, on the 28th of February. You're all cordially invited to attend and to bring your friends. I think I shall now turn over the series to Dr. Kepp. If you don't feel like writing out the questions, I can ask them no, orally. I think sometimes I'd as soon have I'd as soon have it orally. I can well, get if there are drift some to the who question. Have already written. Anybody wants to ask orally? Yeah. It's perfectly all right with me. All right. As Dr. Sam has said, uh, those who want to pose their questions orally, orally may do so. Uh, Otherwise, if you have already written out the question, what you're I'm asked, why is there so great a need of the Jew to absorb material from the outer world and reconvert it as against original Jewish thought? Well, original thought consists of taking material from the outside world and converting it. There is no instance, at least there is no longer a remember, remember, rememberable instance of a civilization which arose ex nihilo. There is no such thing. Uh, the first civilization was very primitive. The second built on the first, the third on the second and the first, the fourth on the third, second and first, and so on. What a civilization can do is to give a new turn to take material and to reconstruct it in combinations which offer a new pattern and a new outlook. It's one of the remarkable things of world literature that the greatest of all books use an ancient theme. Uh, it must strike one frequently that a Milton, a Dante, a Virgil, a Homer, these are the four great names in world literature, didn't use original material. They didn't invent. They took ancient legends and they rewove them. If you take the modern world, why did Thomas Mann, who I think is the outstanding man of letters, the Goethe of the 20th century, why did he have to go for his greatest work to Joseph and his brothers? He found there an inspiration. He took that material and he converted it into something new. There is newness and original genius in Joseph and his brothers. But if he had been challenged to produce something so original, which in every respect hadn't appeared in the world before, he couldn't have done it. There is no such, pardon? But the very essence of Judaism, the very essence is the concept of God, which was an original idea at that time. I don't know whether it was. But well, that's I, the theory of it. No, I don't think it is. You know very well that there has As been... God. You, you, As No, God. you know very well that there is a considerable, respectable 
uh, opinion to the effect that uh, monotheism appeared among the among the Egyptians in the time of Ikhnaton and I beg your pardon it's breasted it's held by a number of respectable scholars uh, that you will find in the hymns of the Babylonians and here it isn't breasted here you will find it in parallel columns in the German edition of Dubnov's history that some of our Psalms appear in the Babylonian in the original in other words you can't talk of a sort of Minerva springing out from the head of a Zeus in the case of a people uh, you will find you will find material paralleling the song of songs among the Egyptians you will find material paralleling the wisdom literature of the Jews among the Babylonians and among the Stoics what we did was that this material when it came to us we converted uh, in the sense that what shall I say that parents begetting children don't beget them merely themselves they are themselves the continuity of their parents but they transmit to them something which is a characteristic they acquired there is no such thing as a springing out into life unless you happen to believe and I won't dispute the view here unless you happen to believe that at a certain date God appeared to the Jewish people and told them what he hadn't told anybody else that is the only basis on which you can accept this uh, uh, what shall I call it this uh, uh, this uh, monolithic idea of creation it doesn't exist in the world the genius of man consists in reinterpretation not in a sudden outburst an explosion of something that never existed before and the Jews like others flourished on the capacity to take from the surrounding world and make it their own but it's been the characteristic of all civilizations the Greeks took their mathematics from the Egyptians it was the Egyptians who had developed it most highly they took a good deal of their astronomy from the Babylonians the Romans took from both when Julius Caesar had to reform the calendar he had to send for an Egyptian mathematician the fiscal system of the Romans was built upon the Ptolemaic system of the uh, of the of the of the system in Egypt there's a continuous interweaving nevertheless Rome had the genius of its own in its uh, in its uh, forms of law it isn't a derogation of the originality of a person as a matter of fact there is something subtle and uh, challenging in the fact that you do take old material and give it a new turn um, I'm asked to, in your opinion is it necessary for the Jewish people to have the same religious attitudes as their forebears in order to regain inner security I don't know what is meant there by the religious attitudes I would say that this notion that the Jews have that history is moral and that unless it's moral it is insane is of the essence of the Jewish personality once you say that and merely take that as your framework you leave yourself a lot of room for variation I don't think it's necessary for a Jew today to have that religious attitude for example which uh, insisted that revelation came to Moses on Sinai to the Jews at Sinai to the prophets direct from the inspiration of God these are the incidentals of the culture the essential culture is the transfusion of history with the moral purpose and the dedication of a people to that moral purpose I would say the difference between the Jewish outlook and that, let us say, of a Christian, a moral Christian, may be seen also from this point of view. A Jew cannot exist in isolation. Supposing they were born somewhere in the interior of Tibet, an extremely brilliant, uh, sensitive, spiritually prehensile person who went through the same experiences, let us say, as Abraham, uh, vision the four visions the Godhead in the same terms Abraham smashed the idols of his father he couldn't lead a Jewish life unless he knew other Jews or unless if you want he started to build a Jewish people because the notion of Judaism is tied up with the harnessing of the people to a purpose and not merely the existence in vacuo or as a philosophy of certain principles now if the Jewish people is linked in its purposiveness to these things and declares either we live thus or we don't deserve to live at all 
that is Jewish. And you will not find that strain anywhere else among other peoples. The fact that the Jews once in Palestine could challenge their own title to the country, could say, we were admitted only on these terms. Who begged them to do it? What compulsion was there on them to cast a doubt upon the validity of their own title deeds to Palestine? It's unknown elsewhere. Now, this spirit constitutes the religious essence. You may interpret it in a variety of forms, but as long as that overall attitude is there, then the secondary attitudes are, in my opinion, uh, not of uh, primary importance. Uh, what is your prognosis as to the future development of Israel as the cultural center of Jewish civilization, or in the light of all your theory as to its raison d'etre, and in view of the chaotic influx of refugees who perhaps are not even particularly Jew conscious in a positive sense? Uh, number two, uh, where in an Ecclesiastes lies the particular Jewish coloration in, the cyni in this cynical work? Number three, this is a wholesale business, would you not relate, would you not relate Jewish interestedness in former, uh, uninterested in the form of combative sport to their being an Oriental people, sport not popular in the Orient? Well, I must answer these questions briefly. My prognosis for Israel that's really a request for a prophecy. I don't know. Uh, the attempt is being made, of course, by those who have the original purposes of the Zionist movement at heart to keep both the diaspora and the Israel in the original channel of creation and to, to prevent the flooding of the original purpose by this enormous influx. Because we've got two floods. We've got the Jews who fled to Israel from the bankruptcy of Europe and the Jews who fled into the Zionist movement in America from the bankruptcy of assimilation. And both Israel and the Zionist movement here are being flooded. And there is the struggle. I need hardly say that where my sympathies stand and the outcome, I don't know whether we have a contract with the Almighty to go on existing forever. We may succeed, we may not succeed. The Jewish people is mortal. Whether it has another thousand years or only another hundred years is something that I can't judge. And a judgment of mine would be valueless anyhow. Wherein is Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes lies the particular Jewish coloration in this cynical work? Well, it lies in the interweaving of the material, first of all, the attribution of the book to King Solomon, and the turning of the phrases in such a way as to indicate that he was a king, he was a king in Israel, that he was a rich king, and he was a wise king, so they became associated with Solomon. Then at the end, there is the interpolation, let us hear the summary of the whole thing, fear God and uh, uh, for in the end, uh, all deeds will be judged by him. It has been integrated in that way. And finally, its coloration is given to by the fact that in spite of a great deal of discussion and temptation to the contrary, it was included in the sacred books. Actually, it stands out a little bit like a sore thumb. But they did their best to file off the edges and to put a pious uh, uh, snuffle at the end of it, so it was angled. But actually, one can see that it is uh, um, one of those sides of material, one of those uh, bodies of material which wasn't completely assimilated, just like the book of Esther, which is a completely atheistical book, and is in a certain sense far more cynical than Ecclesiastes, because in the book of Esther, it has been interpreted by Jewish writers as a most, uh, uh, something like a slander on the Jews. Uh, Peretz, for example, has a little sketch of his, he talks about Purim with distress and misery, calls Mordecai the first Jewish pimp at a royal court and uh, Esther the first Jewish prostitute. And certainly there isn't anything particularly elevating or edifying in the whole of that story of oriental intrigue. So that too is an instance of material which hasn't been properly absorbed. Would you not relate Jewish uninterestedness in form of combative sport to their being an oriental people? sport not popular in the Orient? I wouldn't do so. First of all, the Oriental people of the time of uh, the Maccabees had caught from the Greeks the full measure of the excitement. And you found in, in the city of Antioch on the Orontes, you had as large a uh, Circus Maximus almost as in Rome. I think it was the third or the fourth city in the Roman Empire later and already in the time of the 
of the uh, Seleucid kings. It was an enormously important city and had its contests and its shows and its theaters and its parties and its uh, squabbles and its fights. So that if you didn't have the formal sporting forms uh, originally, they caught on very rapidly. The Jews fought it. In fact, the Maccabean War was waged in part quite uh, um, formally around the question of whether Jews should attend these spectacles. But you had something else among them. You had among the Oriental kings the huntsmen, which was the hunting king who was a famous Oriental figure, whether it was a uh, Nimrod or an Asurbanipal, uh, long before the rise of the Roman Empire and uh, before the rise of the, of the uh, Athenian Empire and the, uh, and the Greek states. You had these kings who called themselves huntsmen. It's extraordinary that among the Jews there isn't a single king who was famous as a hunter. They never went out on these uh, sporting expeditions which took the form of the hunt and in which there was the contest and competition in that form. You had Jewish kings who were uh, evil in this way, evil in that way, but they were not sportsmen, they were not hunters, they were not riders on horseback uh, in that sense. So that the parallel to the Western sports lies in the hunting kings of the East, and there isn't a single instance in the whole of the Bible. There are only two instances in the Tanakh of a sporting expression. One is uh, of, of the sun that goeth forth it's in the psalm, the sun that goeth forth in the morning like a strong man about to run a race. And there's an expression when Joab and the Abner, the two generals of uh, King David, were in a fight. They suggested that the young men should fight it out only. And they used the words, uh, Yesachaku, let the young men play before us. Those are the only two fragments which are, that are found in the, in the Tanakh. So that uh, this is the transposition from the sportive in the arena to the sportive in the hunting field. Now, there was a question at the back which I had to, somebody wanted to ask something. Yeah, what is it? Well, I uh, think you've covered it in some understanding, but it's something I, I don't fully grasp. Uh, you said that uh, many things that the uh, Illuminati and the Jews have been Interpretation of the information from another group. Well, I think it's exactly clear. I think uh, what I'd like to put is this here. Uh, in the light of further information, the light of new information, a better interpretation comes out. In the light of a new insight, a better insight, another interpretation comes out. Actually, the idea of a single God is uh, has a more has a, 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 a meaning that so far we can't uh, we can't we can't uh, change it. I mean, it's deeper, it's more specific, it, it, it has a better explanation of things. Not that I think that even 10,000 years ago, but they won't be able to uh, actually interfere with it. Uh, even in science, in the light of information, better interpretations come out. Of course, nothing is fine. There's a constant growth. You know, the world is too complex for us to come down to final interpretations on anything. But in the light of new information, today, tomorrow, the next day, thousands of years later, better interpretations come out. Well, that's a, that's a restricted interpretation of what I said. I meant it in a wider sense. I said that original creation is on top of material taken from somebody else that one doesn't invent both the material and the idea. I'll give you an instance from Shakespeare. Shakespeare will take uh, a, a primitive uh, blood and thunder drama about Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. He will take that material and he will turn it into one of these uh, profound psychological, moral examinations of the dilemma of man. Now, where the line is to be drawn as to the original and as to the borrowed is very difficult to say. What I was aiming at was that one doesn't invent the raw material. Take the Yiddish language. It is a new thing in the world. The Yiddish language is something which nobody else has. Well, for that matter, every language is something which a people has and nobody else has. But we took the raw material from the Germans and we worked on that. I meant to say that one does not at the same time invent a world and the material of the world. Only God did that, the Yeshmi Ayan. Everybody else must take material which exists and build the original stuff on the material which he got from somebody else. I'm asked uh, 
Teferit. What is this? Teferit. Bachurim Kachom. What is what is this? I can't read the Hebrew script here. Pardon? Teferit what? Teferit Bachurim. Well, the boat the, the, the looks like a kuf to me. Kacham. A kocham. Or giveret or giburem kocham. You mean that is an expression of the the pride of the strong man is in his is in his strength. Well, that doesn't mean to say that. The uh, Yes, but it doesn't. Yes, giveret But it doesn't mean to say that they uh, uh, that they glorified it. You see, the Jews went in for athletics. They didn't go in for sports. You must distinguish between athletics and sports. Athletics calls for the vigor uh, of the body, the training of the body. Sports calls for the participation of vast masses in a ritual which glorifies the competitive system. The competitive system. That is not the same thing as the training of the body. For that matter, as you know, we are bidden in the Talmud, the Jewish father is bidden in the Talmud to train his son in riding, swimming, and shooting. But that is not the competitive, that is the athletic and, if you like, the hygienic approach to life. Now, what is the uh, question? Why don't you believe that the story of Joseph had really happened and there's only some kind of an... In, what of an inkling of a, of a fantastic... It is only... So, oh, why I believe it's happened, why it didn't happen. Well, uh, I don't believe it happened because it's too nice. Uh, life doesn't act that way and it is altogether too charming. There may have been some such incident but all of those uh, charming episodes which fit so beautifully into what ought to be a literary experience, selects of the that that's how it was. It must have been otherwise, and it was fixed up like this. And uh, what reason have I to believe that it actually happened? There is no evidence, there is no historic support from the outside, there are no legends. Uh, oh, if that's enough, well then, if you take that point of view, very well, but I don't take that point of view that it's enough. I beg your pardon? The Sefer Ayosha does not tell of, uh, of Joseph. There are old books, the Sefer Ayosha and the Melchamot uh, Hashem. Pardon? No, not of Joseph. The Sefer Ayosha tells the story of the, of the kings and of the uh, tribal struggles. It does not tell the story of Joseph's descent into, uh, into Egypt. The Sefer Ayasher, which is spoken of, in the, in the, which is referred to in the, uh, in the Tanakh, in the in, in not in the Tanakh, in the Chumash, does not refer to the story of Joseph. There is a separate book, Sefer Yes. Now you are talking. Now you are talking of two books. You are talking of the Sefer Ayasher, which is referred to in the Tanakh, which is the old Sefer Ayasher on which presumably these stories are built, and the Sefer Ayasher among the apocryphal stories, which is merely which is merely a copy of what is taken in the Tanakh. For that matter, in the Book of the Jubilees, you will find the repetition of the whole story in the Sefer Eilach you'll find also a repetition of the story. But these are much older than the Tanakh. Uh, would, these, would this be possible, possible book be uh, considered... Corroboratory? Not at all, because it comes much later. Oh, it comes No, it comes much later. The, the, the apocryphal books come from the first uh, century uh, before the Common Era until the second century of the Common Era. They tell some fantastic stories. They do tell fantastic stories, very interesting ones. We don't accept them as history. Is it not probable that without the need of the refugees and its effect on world opinion, Israel would not have come into being? It's a very, a very, uh, a very pointed and a very, uh, if I may say so, a very intelligent observation. But the interesting thing is that the rise of European nationalism, as it affected the Jewish people, did not pour itself into the Zionist movement. The terminology of European nationalism will be found in the Bund, which was the, the not, I don't mean the German Bund, of course, I mean the, the Jewish Bund which believed in, uh, in Gaulish nationalism, in the Gaulish nationalism of Simon Dubnov, in the Gaulish nationalism of Paris, but not in the Zionist movement. Where there was a response to contemporaneous conditions, the flight was toward a modern nationalism without Palestine, because Palestine stood for, in their opinion, for a reactionary upsurge in the Jewish people. Zionism was based upon a recrudescence of a Palestino-centric consciousness side by side with a fear of the solvent properties of the modern world. I had mentioned before, and I shall deal with this again, that Peretz was an anti-Zionist. 
that Mendele was a non-Zionist, ignored the movement to all practical, to all intents and purposes, and Shalom Aleichem was a non-Zionist. These men were Golos nationalists. They wanted Yiddish as the language of the Jewish people and not Hebrew. They wanted a Jewish Poland or a, a Jewry in Poland. They fought for national minority rights. And that is where the modern nationalism found its Jewish reflex. I might give you an interesting, a rather fascinating parallel. I mean, this, the whole subject is very fascinating. There are many people who believe that, for example, the Jewish National Fund was a rebirth, uh, was a reinterpretation by the Jews of the single tax theory of, um, uh, of, uh, energy, of, energy, of uh, poverty and progress. Now, the, they're of the opinion because the Jewish National Fund began its work in the 20th century, and after Henry George had produced his effect in various countries, they, they do not know, most of them, that the idea of the Jewish National Fund was first mooted at the Catholic Conference of 1882. Now, the Jews who went to the Catholic Conference were some of them masculine, the large majority were Orthodox Jews, and even the masculine were what we would consider today fanatically Orthodox. If you see pictures of them, you see them with face and with beards, and it was there that the Jewish National Fund, the redemption of the soil as the common property of the Jewish people and its removal from the area of speculation of private profit was first moved. It was in 1900 or 1901 that at the London Zionist Conference, the National Fund became a uh, practical body. Now, this uh, makes it evident that it was not modern socialist theory and not the theory of, uh, of um, Henry George, which influenced the birth of the Jewish National Fund. Those Jews didn't know anything about socialism. I doubt whether Henry George had been translated into Hebrew or into Russian, but they didn't read Russian. Certainly hadn't been translated into Hebrew. And if they uh, knew what a socialist was, or thought they did, he was to them a man with Chazar and Kippur. That was about all they knew about socialism and socialists. Nevertheless, this socialist measure, the Jewish National Fund, was born among those Jews. And it's quite a mistake to think that it has to do with modern socialist theory. Afterwards, it assimilated socialist theory and technique for its ideological affirmation and buttressing. The same thing happened with Zionism. The modern nationalism of Europe was poured into the Gaulish nationalist movements of the Jewish people and, the, and into the assimilatory movements. The Zionist movement after it got the impression that it got its impulse also from modern, Jew modern European nationalism. But it didn't. It got it from the prophets and from the will to maintain the identity of the Jewish people in its old cultural, ethical, and religious forms. Jewish sport and athletics. What about David and his slingshot? What about David's wife upbraiding him for dancing in the street? What about the Samson stories? Well, now, David and his slingshot, it's a weapon. You might as well say the Jewish bowmen, the Jewish fighters, a sling in those days was a weapon. It was used uh, by the uh, shepherd against uh, marauding animals, and that is why David, the shepherd, is pictured as using it against Goliath. The Jews were fighters. They couldn't have survived without being fighters, but the point is they did not make of life a mimicry of eternal warfare in a combative ritual. What about David's wife upbraiding him for dancing in the street? Well, saying dancing in the street is that's a little bit ridden. He wasn't dancing in the street, and he hadn't taken a drop too many. He was dancing before the ark of God when his wife Michal sneered at him and said, "The king of uh, Israel dancing before the ark." It was not uh, to stand dancing in the street, and it was a religious dance. And in his case, it needn't have been any more sportive or combative than the dancing of the Hasidim. A rikidl among the Hasidim certainly isn't to be compared with a with a, with a dance anywhere else. In any case, dancing is not necessarily combative or sportive. And what about the Samson stories? They are stories of strength, but they are not stories of sports. I, I've got to make it clear that sports have to do with the organization of society into competitive groups expressing themselves in focus through the representatives of those groups. Sports have to do with vast arenas and organizations and passions and with literature suffused by the competitive passions. It has to do with fights among groups as to whether the blues and the greens or the reds and the yellows among the ancients 
a tremendous cheering and roaring in the Rose Bowl in California, in the, in, the, uh, in the arenas of the ancient world, in the Wembley Stadium. It isn't just people having some fun. Uh, the private competition of two persons over a game of cards or a game of chess isn't exactly a sporting event. It may be a private amusement. Sport has to do with the organization of society round these excitements in a ritual which takes, uh, which takes a formative part in the entire civilization. Yiddish appears to wane. Inconsistencies, grammatical, etc. Well, that's a peripheral thought. Yiddish is definitely on the wane. And it's on the wane for a uh, tragic reason that the folk sources of Yiddish have disappeared. You haven't got now tailors and shoemakers and butchers speaking a natural Yiddish. Uh, you haven't got uh, semi-educated Jews who pick up their Jewishness in the street, who pick it up in the, in the, in the Gessel, in the shtetl. And Yiddish is becoming one of two things nowadays. It is either the pidgin Yiddish of a Manasseh Skolnik and even of the, uh, and even of the, uh, occasionally of the newspapers, the kind of Yiddish which you now get in the plays of Maurice Schwartz, who wants to be sure that even semi-literate Jews, I mean semi-literate Jewishly, will understand him, or else you have the fine, sophisticated cultural Yiddish of the Yivo, which is quite scholarly. So you've got two things. You've got one, it's decline and degeneration among masses. On the other side, it's uh, refinement into a particularly subtle and the delicious language among the elite. You haven't got the masses. Hebrew has it. But uh, that, as I said, is uh, peripheral. That exhausts the questions. And we meet, I hope, uh, once more in a month from now. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. 